three minutes to give people a little bit of time uh, to get on. And after this session, everyone, uh, we'll, we will have a, a, a short break, call it a lunch break, uh, after this session is over. And then we'll come back uh, and you will reconvene um, you know, after that break. So we'll get started in maybe two more minutes. Ian, once you confirm everyone is on board. Hello. Hello, hello. All right. Uh, in these, in this quick 30 second, 60 second check, can everyone, can panelists, can you check your microphones, uh, unmute yourselves and just make sure we've got you clear? Hey everyone. Nice to see you. Hi guys. Hi Good there. Morning. Delegate Charcuti in here. Brooke Learman. Kelly Crawford. Hi Ben. Hey. How are you? Good. Excellent. Thank you Hello, all. Hello, Mr. Secretary. Hello. Y'all look ready for daytime, daytime TV. Looking good, everybody. <laughs> oh, I was worried I was going to be late. I was just out door knocking for the census. I like ran up here. No, that's, that's awesome. putting that work. No, that's, we, we want you to put that work in. We don't want to take up too much of your time today, but. No, we, this is great. Everyone Thanks for today. having us. Appreciate that. We're going to probably take one more minute and I'll, I'll get it started, okay? Just as a reminder for everyone, the Q&A function is a better way to post your questions than putting them in the chat. In the chat, they might get buried. Uh, in the Q&A, they, uh, they stay there un until they're answered. And even after they're answered, you can still look at them with the answers. And you can get to that at the bottom panel where you can mute yourself, start your, well, you panelists, attendees can't see mute or start their video but panelists you can mute and start your video and there are some other options for for q a and chat there is there a facebook live link that i can post i can share that link in the chat yes i'll do that okay okay so cool thank you everybody for joining us today again uh, i had technical issues so i couldn't get on to to the zoom so i had to set up a new zoom account but I'm really excited again uh, and, and thank uh, Jackie Patterson, who's one of my long-term colleagues with NLCP, uh, for doing that, the ninth siege lecture. And uh, I mean, I think that was a powerful presentation. And again, that history um, is important to talk about and that history was just happening today. And, and I, I wanna move now to our next session. Really excited to see uh, the, our, our set of panelists. So as part of this annual symposium, we, we want to institute this kind of report back session from, our, from delegates and from our agencies to see how are our, you know, when in our state and our surrounding area, uh, you know, including DC, are we really advancing environmental justice? And, and, what, are, and what are the folks that, that we've elected and people who are, you know, have been appointed to positions in different agencies, what are they doing to make sure that uh, environmental injustices that folks are experiencing in the region have been addressed? So, uh, this is the second one I believe that we've done, and this is actually in many ways a I've, we're trying to model this kind of conversation after some work in North Carolina. So the North Carolina Community-Based EJ Summit, they've been doing this for every year since 1998, having a report back session with uh, local officials and with agencies. So I was really trying to borrow from that for for this very important discussion. So I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have uh, Delegate Brooke Lehrman with District 46, representative of Baltimore City. Uh, we have Delegate Julian Ivey, District 47A, uh, a representative of Baltimore. We also have Secretary uh, Ben Grumbles with the Maryland Department of Environment. We have Director Joseph Gill, Department of Environment for Prince George's County. Uh, we have Delegate Lord Charcutian, uh, District 20, Montgomery County. We have, also have my friend, um, uh, Kelly Crawford, who's the Social Director of the Air Quality Division of the Department of, of, of Environment, Energy and Environment in Washington, D.C. Let me just go through your bios real quick. So we have, so just a little bit more. So Delegate Learman uh, it works with neighborhood associations and individuals throughout the city and her district on safer streets, cleaner and greener streets. 
Uh, she uh, has, has done a lot of work around uh, Phil's Point. She's also serving the boards of Downtown Baltimore Family Alliance. Uh, she's, she's, she's been a champion for communities and really has focused a lot on um, mass transit and also community development. And we've had uh, numerous conversations about how do we advance environmental justice in our state. Uh, delegate Ivy is a state delegate in the Maryland General Assembly, was the first vice chair of Prince County uh, House delegation. Uh, delegate Ivy is, is, is uh, here to really talk about some of the issues that he's been aware of and trying to address as relates to environmental justice in the county, Princess County, which county I live in. Delegate Chark Udian has been a member of House of Delegates since uh, 2019, February 9th. He's a member of the Economic Matters Committee. Also has, has done work uh, with the Women's League, uh, legislative, Women Legislators of Maryland. Uh, she's really been focused on energy democracy and energy equity issues. And I think she'll talk about that in her, in her comments. Uh, uh, also, we have um, Director Gill again. He's Director Prince George's County Department of Environment. Uh, he's officially started serving in, in May 2019 before coming to uh, Department of Environment. Uh, he worked um, with the Environmental Justice Commission. He's a former chair of the Environmental Justice Commission. Uh, he also has been chair of the Prince George's County Climate Action Commission at the Intercostal Watershed uh, Steering Committee. In addition, again, we have uh, Secretary Ben Grumbles. Uh, he was nominated by Governor Larry Hogan and confirmed in the Senate in 2015. So he's done a lot of work uh, on the Chesapeake Bay, the Maryland Climate Change Commission. Uh, he has served as vice chair of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, he has also served previously as the president of the U.S. Water Alliance. So uh, Secretary Grumbles brings a lot of experience to this position. I'm really excited to hear about uh, his work again, uh, on events of environmental justice in the state. And then to close, uh, not really to close, but in our introduction, again, we have Associate Director Kelly Crawford. She's Associate Director of the DC Department of Energy and Environment Air Quality Division and Chair of their Equity Working Group, very, very important. She's a DC native with over 10 years of experience as an environmental engineer and emergency management professional, including air quality compliance. And I learned that Kelly, uh, knows a lot about plants. We had a recent conversation about my micro, my micro farm at my house, and she gave me some really good insight about how to build a nice border uh, using, what do you call them, Kelly, winter, winter berries? So I'm gonna follow you up on that. So- I just want you to use native plants and not butterfly bush. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I know. Uh, thanks for correcting me in front of everybody. I will not use butterfly bush, even I still got them. What am I gonna do with them though? Okay, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so let's get into this session, y'all. So, I think, again, this, this session is really, really important. Um, we, we really are, are here to talk about what, what agencies and what the delegates are doing on these topics. So we have the first question. You know, so thank you for being here today. Um, I really want to kind of get a quick kind of overview of how you have been involved in your role in the government or in policymaking uh, and, and looking at issues of environmental justice. And I want to start with delegate... Uh, Learman first. Sure. Um, first, just thank you so much for having us all here today, uh, Professor Wilson, Dr. Wilson. Really appreciate it and uh, appreciate our relationship and the work that you are doing uh, to highlight the needs um, of communities all over Maryland. So thanks for having us all here today. Um, I guess, you know, I'll start, um, you know, what are we doing? What is environmental justice? Um, I think I'll start um, when I first ran for office. Um, I was, it was a very hot summer day um, and my district is all of the neighborhoods around the harbor in Baltimore City. And that includes what you see before a Ravens and, or Orioles game, you know, the, the beautiful inner harbor and the Four Seasons, but it also includes eight public housing developments um, and most of the Latino neighborhoods or Latino uh, majority neighborhoods in the city. So it's a very diverse district. Um, and very unequal. There's a lot of inequities in my district, um, a huge amount of income inequality. And um, I didn't know the district as well then as I do now. And I went to a neighborhood called Curtis Bay um, to door knock. And I had never spent much time there. I'd been to a community meeting or two, but it was a really hot Saturday afternoon. Um, and I went to door knock and it smelled so bad <laughs> that it was almost hard to breathe. And as I was door knocking more and more, you know, I started feeling lightheaded. I was dehydrated, of course, but I also just, the smell was overwhelming. And it was the smell from the industry. 
um, and, the, and the plants that surround the neighborhood. And uh, I remember at one point I was rounding a corner, it's all row homes, and I was rounding a corner on a sidewalk and I looked next door and there was a chain link fence to a little backyard and it was parched earth, no grass, um, and there were two little big wheel bikes in the backyard and then rat holes um, all throughout the backyard. And I just stopped and I wasn't sure whether to want to like punch the wall. I was so angry and frustrated that this was how a family was living and this is what this neighborhood was dealing with or whether to cry. Um, and so I, I will never forget that afternoon because I, it really it made a huge impression on me and the importance of environmental justice and, and making sure that every community has agency over its own destiny. Um, and to me, the struggle for environmental justice really involves recognizing that many communities don't have any agency, right? And those communities are majority Black, majority Latino, or immigrant working class neighborhoods, and they are subject to disproportionate burden of pollution, contamination, um, here in the city, huge heat island effects, you know, a lack of trees so that it's hotter. Uh, and, and to me, the struggle for my environmental justice in Maryland is about empowering those neighborhoods, involving them in communicate, involving them in discussions and being an advocate with them and alongside them to build healthier and, and greener um, and cleaner neighborhoods. Um, so that's a, a lot of what I bring um, and what I try to keep in mind when I'm working on, an, on legislation, on all different types of legislation um, in the House of Delegates. Thank you. Um, Delegate Avi? Well, thank you so much uh, for having me on, Professor. Um, it's always tough to go after Delegate Learman, um, but I will try to do my best. Um, and, and specifically, of course, uh, Delegate Charcutian uh, has been leading on, on you know, environmental justice in the House. Um, she really is um, a, a, just a powerful and needed voice on economic matters. Um, so separately, you know, I served in the General Assembly. Uh, before this, I served in the Chevrolet Town Council. And, you know, we don't have a huge budget, um, but we do have concerns with the environment um, and the future of our little town here. Uh, if you look on September 10th, we had a huge flood that really just devastated the area, um, closed down Route 50, a, a complete four lane uh, highway was shut down, turned into, it looked like a part of the Anacostia River. Um, and, and really it just shows that global warming is real, climate change is real, uh, and environmental justice has to be at the forefront of our priorities as we move forward. Um, when I was on the Chevrolet Town Council, we were mulling about trying to find ways that we could um, get a more accurate air quality uh, testing site here in, in this portion of Prince George's County. Uh, we already have, I believe, uh, two uh, in Prince George's, but not one right here in the center of the county. And it's something that we need because we have a huge concrete batching plant uh, right down the street in Bladensburg, um, which, you know, I, I do also want to give them a little bit of credit because they've been making some interesting innovations uh, to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, reduce the environmental uh, footprint in general. But nonetheless, it's a concrete batching plant. And there's a lot of dust that goes into the air uh, and it's impacting um, Chevrolet, it's impacting Bladensburg and other little communities uh, in the surrounding jurisdiction. Um, we're right off of the Anacostia River. Um, you know, I, I know a whole bunch of people here because of their work with the watershed. And I want to thank you all for that work that you've been doing. Um, but it, it's very clear that we have to take climate change and environmental justice uh, much more seriously here in the state of Maryland and across the nation as well. I was just on a, a, um, was it a, a forum, a legislative forum yesterday, um, where someone asked us about renewable energy and, you know, how, what we're doing to prioritize it. And, you know, somebody mentioned that, you know, local jurisdictions don't want to have, let's take Ocean City, Maryland. Um, there's a, a fight about having wind turbines off the shore there. And, you know, I, I do believe that local jurisdictions should have some say, um, but not when it comes at, you know, the, the, the detriment of the state as a whole and the people as a whole. I think that we should be moving to um, renewable energy sources as quickly as we can, and we should be mandating where we can. Um, 
that we make those movements, waiting for these jurisdictions um, who some of them have concerns about, you know, the tourist industry, um, you know, slowing down. I, I think it's a, it's a concern, sure, but I think the larger concern should be that, you know, our, our state, our nation, uh, we're not doing our part um, to move us towards this zero emission footprint um, where we should be uh, quite frankly, as soon as we can get to. So here in the state of Maryland, we've been doing a lot of great things to move us in the right direction. Of course, you know, I'm always the guy who says we could be doing more. Um, uh, the nation as a whole, I mean, goodness, there's, we're, we're, we're really behind um, in, in this effort here. Um, but I, I want to thank you again for having me on Prince George's County. This is a huge issue, even if it's not at the forefront uh, of people's minds. Um, it's something that we can't just ignore. It's not just going to go away. So we have to address it. Thank you. Thank you for that. And there's a lot of stuff that we're doing as a team of Princess County, but we can talk about that later. I, I just put it in a chat uh, for Secretary Grumbles when we have the chance as part of this discussion to maybe talk about that air quality piece a little bit more uh, in your comments. I think this is a really important question about having more uh, local community-based monitoring where you have in our uh -oh. Um so, Grump, Secretary Grumps is on you next. Secretary Grumps, can you, can you hear us? Can y'all hear me? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, you're, go ahead, Secretary Grumps. Go ahead. You're, you're uh, breaking up a bit. I don't know if it's on my end or yours, but. Um, um, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll change. Okay, thank you. I'll, yeah, go ahead. Thanks so much. Well, clean air is health care. I mean, I, that, that speaking of air quality and uh, water is life and access is justice to it. So water equity uh, and, and the siting and regulation of waste, particularly toxic waste and diesel emissions from traffic are all important. Um, I'm just, I'm uh, honored to be part of this discussion to learn. Um, the question was, uh, how'd you get involved and what are you doing right now? I just very quickly simply say, I had the pleasure of working on Capitol Hill in the 1980s and, and getting involved in the writing of fundamental uh, reauthorizations of the, the Clean Water Act and the Superfund Law, and revisions to the Clean Air Act. And then I worked at EPA headquarters uh, uh, overseeing the National Water Program and it's an honor to be in Maryland as the environment secretary because we have uh, jurisdiction over regulating air, water, waste, um, hazardous materials and providing infrastructure um, and trying to find that important balance of, of clean water, affordability and uh, sustainability. And I also, as you mentioned, I'll, I'll just simply close by saying I, I uh, in my role, I chair the, the State Climate Change Commission, which is putting significant attention and focus on climate justice and energy burden um, as we race to uh, find ways to reduce emission, greenhouse gas emissions and increase climate resiliency. Uh, and, and I also uh, am on the Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities Commission and, and MDE, the Department of the Environment Staff Act Commission. And, and we'll talk more about that and, and how to strengthen it and, and move forward positively. But uh, it's, it takes a group effort and a real commitment from the top uh, to find uh, the right tools and to keep advancing the ball because we have a lot of work to do. I, and, and Maryland Department of the Environment and I acknowledge uh, we have a lot more we can do. The state is a national leader in environmental protection, um, but we need to um, accelerate our efforts towards diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And um, I'll, I'll just stop there, Sokovi. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, so, uh, Director Gill, how did you get into this uh, government policy making and, and as it relates to environmental justice? So the Prince George's County delegation to the Maryland General Assembly back in 2018 established an environmental justice commission to look at issues of environmental justice within Prince George's County. 2018 commission uh, came up with a list of issues identified for further exploration. 
the Maryland General Assembly, again, the same delegation, reauthorized the same commission for 2019, adding several new members. Among the members included yourself, uh, Dr. Wilson, a uh, member of the County Council, MDE, the Health Department, the State's Attorney. And the charge to that commission was to come up with a plan of action. So the group that came together uh, asked, the threshold question was, who can take the action? And the second question was, what action should they take? And I'm going to take a minute here to share my screen, if I'm able to do that. You will see. Um, yeah, uh, make sure Dr. Uh, Director Gill can, yeah, there you go. Okay, is that working? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so go back to the first slide. So the, the commission came up with three recommendations and the, the first was in the area of land use and planning and zoning and whatnot. And essentially um, the concept was to create a, a, a functional master plan which would integrate environmental justice issues within the development and building framework, including siting. Uh, this is something that California uh, uh, explored doing uh, back in 2016, I believe. They passed a law uh, related to that. Uh, some of those uh, specific items were uh, placing conditions on development in environmental justice areas, uh, including stopping it, cumulative impacts, and making sure there was meaningful community engagement. The second recommendation was in the area of health equity, that health impact assessments have to be done in areas that are already overburdened by health issues. We looked at uh, the level of uh, particular contaminants inside the Washington DC Beltway as compared to the level uh, out in Western Maryland. And the disparity is shocking, really shocking. And the third recommendation uh, is creation of environmental benefits districts, which basically says, take the resources and flip them on their head. Um, you have been inequitably distributing development, industrial development in specific areas of the state. Let's go back to those areas and do something about them. Let's green them, let's provide uh, sidewalks and, and trees and gardens and whatnot. I'll do the slides quickly so I don't have to refer to them again. We looked at references from all across the country. Uh, California was very helpful. There's an article in the New School for Social Research published in two, uh, February of 2020 that uh, basically reviews everything that's been done in this area by local governments and state governments for the last 10 years. Very helpful. And third, uh, again, I wanna talk about environmental benefits districts um, because this is the one that, that personally excites me. Basically, there are existing funding streams that the state has for distributor, distribution of highway revenues, distribution of program, local, program open space revenues from the, uh, the transfer tax. The first time you pay a transfer tax, the money goes to uh, recreation and open space uses. There are grant funding programs. A portion of those fundings we recommend should be set aside to, for investment in environmental benefits districts. Last, last topic and then I'll, and then I'll stop uh, for this portion. The same concept could be incorporated on the state level. There's a land use code that has, uh, contains elements for a comprehensive plan. There's six or seven elements. The state could uh, uh, require as part of an element of a local comprehensive plan, considerations of environmental justice and equity issues. Thank you. Thank you for that. So the, I think the bill that uh, that Director Gill referenced from California, I think it should be SB 1000, if that's correct. So all counties in California have to include normal justice into their master, the comprehensive plans. And I just put in the chat, the EBDs, uh, some years ago, and some of you may know this better than many, there was an environmental benefits district program for the state of Maryland. Uh, I forget the exact areas, maybe Yi can talk about that. I think, I think the uh, area that Delegate Avi mentioned was one of those environmental benefits districts. I think it was one was also in Baltimore, but it was unfunded. There was no evaluation of these environmental benefits districts. The ARC has done some work on, uh, on we have environmental benefits district report, and, and we provided some, some, some insight into how to do that in the state of Maryland. So I think that's a really useful concept. That's something for the delegates to think about. You know, environmental justice is just not about stopping stuff. It's about community building. How do you build? How do you grow? How you improve? Exactly. How you sustain? How you exactly. promote well-being? Exactly. That's what EBDs are about. So I really want to highlight. Thank you, Thank you for that, Director Gill. So next, 
uh, want to go to Del- Delegate Charkudian. Now, you know, so let me say something real quick. I get we have questions, y'all, and when we have the time, I'm not gonna get to all the questions. So I'm gonna change things up just a little bit. So you know, but make sure I switch it up. So don't worry, don't worry about the lineup, okay? So De- Delegate Charkudian is on you. Well, thank you. Yes, I was going to say, first, let me say thank you. It's such an honor to be on this esteemed panel. And then let me just highlight that everyone so far has cheated and spoken for more than one minute. So I'm going to go ahead and join um, in the, with the rule breakers. And it's all good. It's all good. We got to break some rules if we're going to we're going to make the changes that we need to make. So I'm with you. Here we go. Um, it is an honor to be with you all. Uh, what a great group of people doing really good work. And Professor Wilson, your leadership on these issues has just been tremendous. And um, It's an honor to work with you and the Institute. Um, So I I wanna put uh, environmental justice in sort of a a slightly bigger context. I serve um, on Economic Matters Committee on the Public Utility Subcommittee. So we work on energy issues. Um, And some of our work and some of my work, I see my role as bringing in legislation that addresses environmental justice, both the legislation that stops the bad things as well as the legislation that invests in communities that have historically um, been the dumping grounds really for pollution. Um, but I think the other part of my job, the part what is, what is part of all of our jobs as policymakers is to change the questions that we're asking and to change the way that we're even imagining what our policymaking is. And the reason for that is we have to go back. I think probably a lot of folks who are on this panel a lot of folks who are listening to this panel um, are aware of this, but I think it can't be said enough that we are where we are now, environmental injustice is not an accident. Like we got to this place because of a 500 year history in this country, and we got to this place because of explicit racist policy, uh, especially over the last 100 years um, in uh, industrialization and in where we chose to put our power plants and where we chose to put industry and who had voice, and it's tied to the redlining. And if we don't acknowledge that, Um, then we can't ever start to make the corrections and make the investments that need to be made. So that's the first thing I think we have to see is that our, our, our forebearers in terms of policymakers, those who came before us, used policy to create this tragedy that we're looking at now. And it is our responsibility. We absolutely can use policy to correct that um, and to shift that. And so I think that's the bigger picture that we have to have all of this uh, lined up in it and really um, making sure we're grounded in this understanding that this is not an accident. This is what we built um, and it is our job to build something different. Um, some of that, of course, has to do with voice and, and Delegate Learman had a chance to speak a little bit about that. And I think we'll talk about that uh, more going forward. But I think the other piece is that we have, and when we think about the questions that we have as policymakers that we need to uh, that we need to, to, to shift, that we need to not accept as policymakers. And, and one of the big ones is this question about, um, do we need to pollute poor communities to have jobs in those communities? And I think this is this false choice when we've looked at a lot of environmental justice bills that have come before my committee, certainly before I got there, I've only been there for a year and a half, but I've studied to some extent what these questions have, have been. I know we're gonna talk later about um, cumulative impact bills that have come before. And what we've consistently been told, we as a society is, um, but we need the jobs. And we absolutely need the jobs, but it is not an acceptable choice. Do you want jobs so you can feed your children or do you want clean air so your children can breathe? That is not an acceptable choice that we give only to poor communities, only to brown and black communities. Um, The the choice for white communities, the choice for well-off communities is not that one. They get Uh, jobs and clean air for their children to breathe. And so we need to first reject that as the question. And then we need to rewrite the questions and start to talk about what are the policies? Because it's policies that we've had in the past that have created that as the question that we're asking. Now the question is what are the policies that we build so that the question we're asking is how do we have jobs in poor communities, jobs in brown and black communities and clean air in those communities and that the two go together. That it's not a balancing act of how much pollution and how many jobs, it is how do we get both. Um, And we can do that if we choose to to shift the narrative and to change the conversation. And we absolutely have the tools at our disposal to do that. The other question that I wanna highlight and and thank you Delegate Ivy for for talking about uh, turbines off off the coast 
um, is this, um, this really interesting conversation about siting of energy generation that we're having now. Now, all of a sudden, so for years and years and years, when we've been siting coal-fired power plants and gas-fired power plants, there has not been a statewide conversation about where should we put them. They just always go in the brown and black communities, and there's a little bit of fight, and then we just keep moving forward. Now all of a sudden we're putting solar panels in more affluent areas. We're putting wind turbines off the coast where people own, uh, own property um, that they've paid a lot of money for. And suddenly this term view shed, which I have to say is grounded in privilege, this term view shed is all of a sudden really important in our public policy conversations. And so now there's this slow walking of the solar panels or slow walking of the wind turbines because people who have access to privilege, people who have access to money, people who have access to power don't wanna look at, their kids are, are still gonna breathe clean air, but they don't wanna look at, um, what I think are some of the most beautiful things in the world, frankly, I would love to, I'd pay, I'd pay extra to be looking at turbines and, and solar panels, but for whatever reason, folks don't wanna look at it. And so that's the fight now. And what I think we just need to be really clear when we're having that fight, when, when, uh, when, when, the, when turbines are being slow walked, when panels are being slow walked, that, the, the, that um, and, I've, and I've tried to bring this into all the conversations. When you say you don't want panels here, the question is, do you want panels here or not, is not the question. The question is, do you want panels here or coal-fired power plants in Brandywine? Do you want wind turbines here or an incinerator in South Baltimore? That's the question that we're asking. And we have to be really clear. And, and the folks who are saying no to turbines and panels have to be really clear about what it is they're saying, because what it is they're saying about where the... Uh, where the generation is 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 going to be happening, and so those are just two questions I'll start with, and and I think we'll probably get to talk more maybe about some of those individual issues, um, and I, you know I think there's also really a lot of really good stuff to talk about in terms of where we invest our efficiency money, where we invest, who gets the jobs with those panels, who gets the jobs with the um, turbines, and so on. But um, I'll stop there. Thank you. You're on mute, maybe? You're on mute. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, hold on a second. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, Kelly, your turn. Go ahead, Kelly. So I think we were on um, how did we get here and how did we get to this work? And um, for me, I, I, um, I came up as an engineer and environmental scientist in air quality. Um, I used to work at Goddard Space Flight Center and um, Goddard really prepared me because it's it's like a whole city there, right? So we have nearly every type of source and it really prepared for my work in DC. Um, when I became air director, there were, I saw so many opportunities to advance um, equity in the work that I was doing every single day. And just the, um, the conversations that I had with my peers and my colleagues, not only in DC, but in my national um, air director circle, um, that there really is just not um, a whole lot of um, understanding within my peers on how to advance environmental justice in our everyday work. And so I saw an opportunity to, um, to be a voice to, um, to lead my peers along because I, I went through 12 years of school and had not one single course on environmental justice, not one single course on equity, not one single course on even soft skills. I'm an engineer. They teach you the math, they teach you the science, but they don't teach you about people and how the work that you do affects people every single day. Um, engineers are not often um, primed with courses on health equity, on, um, on, on public health in general. So um, making the connection between the, the controls that we use to reduce air pollution or the programs that we pursue to um, meet our goals of reducing air pollution or um, establishing our state implementation plans I'm drawing those connections for not only for myself, but for my peers, not only in the district, but also in the region and the country. Um, it just became a passion of mine. And, you know, um, you know, um, like my good friend Sakobi said here, um, me being a black woman in this space is exhausting. Um, it's exhausting because ever since I was in college, I was usually the only girl and the only black person in the room. And um, 
but also, you know, like Sakobi said, like we have to be everywhere. So I have to stay in this space and, and try to be everywhere because, um, you know, especially for clean air, it's a very, very white male dominated space and um, making space for myself there, but also making space for um, opening my, my peers' minds and hearts to um, innovation. And innovation meaning thinking differently about how we approach air quality, thinking differently about how we approach monitoring, thinking differently about how we approach engagement, um, and, and especially for permit writers, thinking, thinking differently about how they approach their work and the types of impacts that they can have on the community and understanding the power that they have and how they're using it um, has just been, you know, a personal passion of mine. And I continue to, to work and to grow and, and to, to try to use my voice wherever I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I know that went longer than uh, we hadn't listed, but I think it was really important for you to give your perspectives, your lived experiences, and, and, and where you are right now, how you get, get here, got, got here. And I also really appreciate Delegate Charcoody and really talk, give, having real talk. We've, we're here because of racism. We're here because of redlining. We're here because of segregation. We're here because of NIMBYism. So this next question, we're going to dig more into uh, some of the legislation. So we, you know, uh, uh, Director uh, Gill referenced in the work in California. You have SB 1000. You have XB, I think, 619. That was a community-based air quality monitoring bill. Someone mentioned in the chat a recent bill that uh, 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 Representative Duckworth has put out about fence line monitoring. We have the, we have S-232 that just passed in New Jersey, a cumulative impacts bill. So we want this part of the discussion to be about environmental justice legislation. Uh, in, in the state of Maryland, uh, uh, in D.C. So, you know, what have we been doing? Have we been successful in getting EJ bills passed? I'm going to start with um, Delegate Ivy first. Again, uh, thank you so much. It, it, it's such an important conversation um, because the clock has been ticking for quite some time now, um, and we're going to approach the, the point where, um, you know, we really can't go back to where we were and where we are now. Um, we need to address these issues absolutely uh, as quickly as we can. Um, Delegate Charcutian um, was talking about some of the provisions in the Clean Energy Jobs Act um, and you know some of the battles that have been taking place um, in her committee and her subcommittee specifically as well. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that she's excited to, to go a little further there, but um, the conversation nationally that's been taking place um, has also been taking place on, on the state level uh, about what we can do to move towards renewable energy sources, um, invest in jobs that are going to you know, promote renewable energy sources, uh, and also uh, move us away from fossil fuel um, and promoting environmental justice, uh, specifically in Prince George's County. Uh, and I saw that you, you threw in the chat there um, about um, the air quality uh, monitoring systems that uh, have been sprouting up or, or planning to be uh, erected. And that's all wonderful, but um, we need to go a little further looking at specifically why industries and specific places, wh why does Prince George's County have so many dumps, um, landfills, things of that nature, and power plants as well? Why do we have concrete batching plants right outside of DC. If, if you look at just the map of the metropolitan region and you zoom out a little bit, it's very clear that in Prince George's County, um, this corridor leading into the district, um, we have an opportunity to have it look a little bit more like um, the Northern Virginia corridor, the 60, Route 66 corridor. Um, and the question is, well, why, why not? Um, and I think the, the glaring answer is that um, redlining, racism, things of that sort, uh, have caused you know, the state of Maryland to, you know, through policy, put these specific burdens in Prince George's County, uh, put them on the backs of, of Prince Georgians, unfortunately. Um, so there's a lot of work that we have to be doing, but there's also work that we have done. And I think that we should uh, take a moment and, and, and celebrate those accomplishments. Um, understanding that, you know, no bill's perfect and there's some things we have to go back and, and, and clean up here or there. Um, but nonetheless, we are moving forward 
Um, we are putting more incentives uh, to our renewable energy sources. Um, we are pushing people towards um, moving towards renewable energy sources. Um, but of course, we, we could be doing more and we could be moving a little more quickly. Well, thank you. I'm going to go to Delegate Learman. And Delegate Learman, we've had conversations about the failed cumulative impacts bills. So I mentioned the, the successful cumulative impacts bill was just passed now three weeks ago in New Jersey. That, I mean, it took 10 years, just a little bit of background. Uh, colleagues of mine like Kim Gaddy, uh, Ana Baptista, and, and Dr. Nikki Sheets, who's going to speak, I think, later today, maybe? I think, yeah, later today. He's going to speak about it. But it took him 10 years. So can you speak about, you know, the, the bills that have passed and, and some of the bills that haven't passed? And, and, and what can we do, as uh, Delegate Avi just mentioned? We got to keep moving forward. But go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and thanks for all your work on this. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I think one of the things that is so important is making sure that we're actually measuring um, what is happening and, you know, mapping and analyzing areas, right, of concentrated pollution across the state, requiring environmental impact assessments and accountability and uh, and using that to move forward um, towards cleaner energy with a focus on opportunities um, for those neighborhoods um, uh, that have been so marginalized and so disproportionately affected. And on the cumulative impacts piece in specifically, you know, I, my, I just ran from a census door knocking event. I was saying that my colleague, Delegate Robin Lewis organized and she has been pushing for some air quality studies, you know, on the Eastern shore, in, Mer in our district and elsewhere, all over the state, if we are not sort of, we have a, a lack of knowledge of how bad it is. Um, and so it's, it's been very difficult to even um, pass legislation requiring measuring um, and keeping track of air quality. Um, in some of these areas. And it's so, it's fascinating to see, you know, industry come in and fight wanting to have um, uh, measuring air quality because they know it's bad, right? Like they don't want it. They don't want us to measure it. Um, but to me, that seems like the most basic thing that we should be doing is making sure that we're keeping track uh, of some of these issues. Um, so I think that's a really important piece that we have to keep pushing on. Um, and, uh, is the measuring and the cumulative impacts um, being a part of um, being a part of all legislation? Frankly, I mean, you know, one of the things that we've often discussed is that. I'm sorry, that's my two-year-old in the background. <laughs> she's fine. She just wants to watch TV, and she's not allowed to right now. <laughs> um, so, uh, one of the things we've discussed in the past is that you know we measure the impact of every bill on small business, um, and we don't. Uh, take the time or have the expertise right now in the General Assembly to measure the impact of every bill um, on our environment um, or whether how to assess cumulative impacts. And that's something that we have to make a priority, frankly. Um, if we're really serious about creating, as Secretary Grumble said, you know, environmental justice, this is also about health. And if we're really serious about creating a healthy state and healthy communities, um, and then we have to develop that expertise and push for it by passing legislation. Um, I'm happy to talk about, you know, other bills that we're working on, but I want to turn it over to my colleague, Delegate Charcutian, too, because she has been at the forefront of some of these clean air issues. I'm sort of the plastics person, and she's got clean air and so um, and energy, and so I'll turn it over to her, if that's okay, to, to yeah, keep going. Yeah, thank you. I was actually going to Delegate Charcutian next, and just to kind of uh, set it up a little bit more. You know, we, we've seen a lot of, you know, part of what I like us to do in, in our state, how do we model, you know, use what's, what's out there? California, and, and I think Delegate Charcotian knows this, has done a lot around, you know, climate and clean energy. Of course, they have a climate fund, partially been funded through the, their uh, cap and trade program, which from an environmental justice perspective, you know, EJ folks were not really supportive of cap and trade for obvious reasons, right, the hot spot that, 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 are, that, that can occur. But Delegate Charcotian, can you really dig into, you know, this connection between, uh, uh, you know, air pollution and energy and, and bills that you're trying to pass, why they're important, and then get to this issue, and we'll talk later about this today in the symposium, around energy democracy, energy sovereignty, energy equity, energy poverty, right? You have to choose between paying for your energy bill, your, you know, your, your food and your medicines. That's a lot of folks who are dealing with that. So I'll stop talking, but can you just go ahead and, and, and speak more to what, you, what you're doing on the bill front and what's been successful and what hasn't, and, and you know, where, where are you moving forward next? Sure, thanks. 
Um, so there's, there's so much in there and I feel like there's a couple of things that I want to highlight. Um, first, I want to come back to saying that when these big picture environmental justice bills, similar to California, similar to the amazing bill that just passed in New Jersey, um, these model bills have come before the Maryland General Assembly. It has been this battle around jobs versus clean air, which I think we absolutely have to reject. And I, and it's, um, it's heartbreaking to see that conversation. And I think the other piece that I want to highlight, though, in thinking about those jobs while we're being, um, while we're really thinking strategically about what it is that we need to do to turn this around, um, we have to also acknowledge that the fossil fuel industry has been subsidized by the federal government for over 100 years and continues to get both federal and to some extent state subsidies. And so now you have clean energy industry that has had been subsidized at some level for maybe 10, 15, 20 years, um, not nearly enough. And there's a lot of people talking about um, you know, that, that, that clean energy ought to um, compete with fossil fuels. And if it can't compete with fossil fuels, which have been subsidized and continue to be subsidized, and I mean direct subsidies, in addition to the fact of the subsidies of we're not paying for the climate impact, we're not paying for the health impact, or the polluters aren't paying for those. We are paying for those. The polluters are not paying for those things. Um, and so, so when folks say, for example, right now, something that everybody ought to be paying attention to is the state of Maryland has an active policy of expanding natural gas infrastructure, specifically actively promoting a pipeline on the Eastern shore that will go through wetlands, that will go through communities who have already environmental justice communities impacted by the poultry industry. Um, and the state of Maryland is actively promoting that right now through MEA, MDE just recommended the wetlands permit to BPW. Um, and the argument is a false argument about natural gas as a bridge fuel, a talk about natural gas as a lower cost fuel talking about it as beneficial to poor people, beneficial to, to Somerset County, which absolutely needs economic development. But again, the choice that we have on the table right now in Maryland is, do you want Somerset County to have economic development? And if you do, then your choice is to support natural gas. And that is a false choice. And I reject that as the choice. We never got to say, Let's think about all of the ways that renewable energy could support Somerset County. Turbines were shut down in Somerset County for land-based wind 10 or 15 years ago in a political fight. Now, uh, Somerset County could benefit from offshore wind if we chose to take state resources and put everything into moving offshore wind forward um, off, the, off of Ocean City um, as quickly as possible. We could target those jobs and benefit Somerset County. But instead, the conversation that we're having is, should we expand the natural gas infrastructure to help Somerset County because um, it is a very poor county and absolutely needs um, needs that support. And so, so here we are again, um, fracked natural gas is cheap because it's been subsidized for years and years and years and because we don't pay for the externalities, the health externalities, the planetary externalities. We don't even count the impact of the methane. Like our, our the EPA, like the, we're, we're so far from even fully understanding the impact of expanding the natural gas infrastructure. And, um, and, so, and so this is this choice that's in front of us right now. And so I think it's important to be thinking conceptually about the big picture bills. Um, and I'm really hoping that we have those conversations as well. But even while we're T having these multi-year conversations about, you know, New Jersey took 15 years to pass. Right now in Maryland, the M MDE BPW is making choices that is going to lock the Eastern Shore into a fossil fuel. And either we're going to be using that fossil fuel for multi-year, multi, -year, multi De multiple decades into the future, or uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have stranded assets, and then there's gonna be a question about who pays for those stranded assets and the the low income people in their rate in their in their um, in energy bills that they are already struggling to pay for um, will be will be paying for for these stranded assets, um, and so uh, so I think that um, it's imp it's this it's this challenge that we always have of sort of this this big picture how do we get these big bills through um, and and big bills that are really important to get through but even while we're doing that conversation we need to be paying attention to the the decisions are being made every day in the state and we need to be be tracking those decisions and making sure that we are that you all everyone who's listening is holding us accountable is holding the Hogan administration accountable um, and really making sure that we're making the right decisions um, right now even if we don't yet have or it might take a few years to pass something like the New Jersey bill well thank you 
I want to go to Kelly next, and, I'm, and then for uh, Director Gill, uh, and first to Director Grumbles, uh, Secretary Grumbles, we're going to go to the commission question. So remember I said before, we're not going to get through all the questions. We have like eight questions, so we're going to probably get to like three questions, and then we're going to have to go to Q&A. But, um, so let me go to Kelly. Can you respond? What do you see on the D.C. side when it comes to, you know, legislation around environmental justice? You know, you're on the front lines uh, in, inside in DOEE, but what are you seeing? So I think there's two things happening right now in D.C. Um, our council is in the process of um, considering the REACH Act, which um, it's not an environmental justice bill per se, it's an equity bill, and equity is environmental justice. If you, are, if you work in the line of work that we do, um, if you, use, if you um, lead with race, then you will, you will lead with environmental justice um, by default. So that's going to, 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 to force um, the district to evaluate um, every piece of legislation that comes through um, for, in, for equity. And um, in the environmental realm, that means um, looking at environmental justice as we promulgate regulations and rules. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, in the meantime, the agency has for two years been working towards developing an um, an, a racial equity impact assessment tool. Um, we actually just finished our first, first cohort a couple of weeks ago um, of, of training through that tool. But um, what that revealed is just that um, down to the staff level, there's a lot of training that needs to be done. There's a lot of relearning that needs to be done, especially for our career professionals who are very good at what they do. But Kind of relearning how to to lead with race and how to consider um, environmental justice as part of their everyday jobs. Um, I think that one of the things that was kind of exciting about New Jersey's environmental justice bill, which requires them to deny a permit if um, the impacts to the community are disproportionate, um, that it empowers the um, the um, the permit writers to to say no, right? Um, right now, a lot, of a lot of times our engineers, they're engineers, they understand the monitoring, they understand the, the emissions calculations, and there's a baseline that they have that's established by national ambient air quality standards and what's promulgated in their state implementation plans, and they abide by that. Um, they don't have right now a mechanism to say, well, even though this particular plant is, is going to produce emissions that are under the threshold or their, their, their individual impact is not that great, um, to say, to, to, you know, to empower them to say, well, it, it doesn't matter what this particular piece of equipment does or what this particular plant does. It's the cumulative impact of all of the emission sources in this neighborhood and the impact it's having on this community that gets greater weight than the needs of this individual permittee. So um, it's new. We'll see how um, New Jersey implements it. I, you know, I feel for, for my colleagues in New Jersey being, you know, kind of the test dummies on how this will work. I imagine that there will be challenges. Um, my program attorney looks at me every day like I'm going to get her sued. <laughs> but, um, you know, th this, is, this is the hard work of kind of undoing a system that is working exactly how it's supposed to in keeping emission sources um, in communities that don't care or perceive to not care and are perceived to be able to withstand the brunt of these, um, receive the, the, the brunt of emissions. But we have to go further than, um, than monitoring. And that's one of the things that concerns me the most when I hear these conversations about air quality. Um, I'm a mom. A lot of us have children, you know, if, if one of my children are sick and, you know, I can look at them, it's like, if you look a little red, my first, my first instinct is not to reach for the thermometer. Well, you look like you're sick, I'm going to see how bad your fever is before I think about what else I can do. The first thing I'm going to do is to try to mitigate, mitigate the impacts of the illness. I'm going to reach for, for something to help the child, to cool the child, before I decide to see how bad the fever is. And I think that as engineers, our first instinct is always to measure, to monitor, to analyze how bad is it before we start taking actions to mitigate the impacts. I think that we have enough information about what we can do to mitigate the impacts of air pollution that are far less costly than the expense of monitoring. It takes two, three years sometimes to realize the impact of um, environmental regulation, especially when it comes to air quality. So, in those two, three years, that community is still breathing the air and um, becoming a sink for those emissions. So uh, I, you know, that's where innovation comes, you know, 
in my, in, in my opinion, that's where the innovation comes from. How do we mitigate impacts while we still measure? Because what you measure matters, but also at the same time, we have to be investing in mitigation efforts more quickly than we invest in monitoring. Um, uh, air quality programs are federally funded. Our funding has been generally flat for the last 20, 30 years. Our obligations continue to increase, but the funding to support our programs do not. So if, you know, if we don't have the federal funding that we need to increase our programming to increase our oversight, it just means that more um, environmental um, violations persist. It means that even the facilities that are um, properly permitted don't get the type of oversight that they could have if we had more robust air quality programs, if we had more robust enforcement programs, and that a lot of these programs are, are driven by complaints. So the, the hungriest mouths get fed, the communities that complain the most get the most inspections, get the most oversight, get the most um, enforcement, get the most violations. However, um, there are communities that traditionally don't complain, and it won't surprise you that those communities are communities of color. And you wouldn't be surprised that when we go into those communities and we investigate sources in those communities, we have never seen a we've never seen a complaint from the community, but we find the most egregious violations at those sources. So for 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 me, it's been um, an opportunity to to lead with race, right? To to lead with where do we where where are the violations coming from? Not necessarily where are the most complaints coming from. And it's not to say that those who complain are, are complaining excessively. It means that there are some communities that are not um, getting the attention that they deserve, or they just become um, reticent to, you know, not being, not, not seeing the assistance from the government that they need, to not seeing their violations be pursued, to not seeing um, the facilities in their neighborhoods be properly policed. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, to kind of force them into good behavior to at least mitigate the, the impacts that they are having that are within their control, let alone the impacts that are um, kind of an accumulation of the number of facilities in their area. Thank, thank you. Some really, really important points that both you and Delegate Charcoulian made. Both of you talked about externalities and sinks. Environmental justice impacts. Communities are being used as sinks for pollution. I mean, it's, I mean, and this is me being provocative, but the reality, we're talking about state sanctioned poisoning of communities. Why aren't we talking about uh, riffing off what you just said, Kelly? Why aren't we talking about zero emissions? If you're going to get a permit, why aren't we talking about zero emissions, particularly not just cumulative impacts, y'all. If you're going to be in this, if you want to build and, 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 and run your facility, zero emissions. We have to be innovative, think outside the box. I appreciate your point about monitoring versus mitigation. Because even as a scientist, I think about monitoring, measuring, right? But what about the solutions? So let's have a solutions forward approach when it comes to improving community health. I think that's what we're talking about here, this conversation. It can be non-regulatory, but what is the solutions forward approach for sustainability, for resilience, for, 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 for just communities and equitable communities? So really important points there. I want to move now, uh, switch questions. I said we're probably going to get to one more question before we get to Q&A. So I want to give opportunity uh, to Dele I mean, Secretary Grumbles first uh, to, to speak to this issue around commissions. So, and, this is all, and then all, second would be uh, Director Gill. So there are a number of commissions and working groups throughout the state working to tackle uh, issues related to environmental health, environmental justice. Excuse me, health disparities. <coughs> oh, sorry. So are we doing enough? Could be doing more. Uh, could you please, uh, Secretary Rumbles, talk about the EJ Commission, talk about the Climate Change Commission. Uh, what are we doing on those commissions? Are, have we been doing enough and what can we do better? I and mean, can you kind of report out a little bit what both of those commissions are doing as relates to environmental justice and climate justice? Yeah, the, the real question isn't about what commissions are there and what are they doing. Citizens want to see commission recommendations and legislative and administrative recommendations translated into action. And so the good news is, is that Maryland has a very strong, very robust public commitment and value behind advancing the ball on environmental protection, environmental justice, and sustainable communities. The Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities Commission 
is an independent commission. It's chaired currently by Camille Burks, who does a great job. She's a, uh, an employee of the Baltimore Health Department. Uh, and there are members who are appointed to that commission. And uh, it's become increasingly clear that the commission uh, could do much more. It could be more effective, could be better coordinated with other other um, policy recommending organizations. And so Maryland Department of the Environment, which is directed to staff the commission, is fully committed to doing that. We had an excellent meeting on September 22nd. I'm very encouraged. The commission is energized. Uh, there are going to be some changes to the uh, membership of the commission. There's some vacancies. There's some shifting around to better align the commission. And from my perspective, I have some of the top staff, talented individuals of the Maryland Department of the Environment to help staff that commission. They're making recommendations. The Commission on Climate Change, the State Commission, has been very active since 2015. Uh, it is well respected. It provides uh, cutting edge and also uh, very important recommendations to the legislature and to the governor uh, we are spending a tremendous amount of time, which is all justified on how to uh, boost efforts on climate justice, um, the energy burden, and coordinate it with the climate change, uh, uh, not just the climate change commission and the, and the, and the uh, greenhouse gas reduction um, plan, but also with the en environmental justice and sustainable communities commission. For me, Sacobi, uh, this is a priority. The governor convinced other governors to sign the environmental justice, diversity, equity, inclusion statement for the Chesapeake Bay region on August 18th. His departments of environment, natural resources, agriculture, planning, all were part of that. We're going to be following through with action plans and the commissions can help inform. Uh, but I, I think I think uh, the, the point is fair, fair uh, and uh, well received from me that the Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities Con Commission can do more. And, and this is the time to make some uh, recommendations, not just regulatory or legislative, but to advance the culture of inclusion, uh, cumulative impacts, all the conversation so far in this discussion about monitoring is absolutely correct. We need to keep doing more. I will tell you uh, without any hesitation that because environmental protection is such a value in Maryland and because it has uh, well-staffed uh, agencies monitoring for air quality across the state for toxic hotspots is important. It's a priority. Uh, we need to do more. It's not just about legislation. It's about funding. Uh, and it's about science-based targeting on areas. But just for the record, let it be said, we should never use science to delay the delivery of environmental protection or environmental justice. Science can actually help us identify and connect the cumulative impacts. It takes leadership, but it also takes a commitment to developing, dec making decisions on on permitting and citing that also are defensible in court and scientifically. And I'm fully committed to helping advance the ball, working with the universities, the citizens, the legislators. I know that uh, this is the right thing to do and it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna do, <clears throat> sorry, quick, quick follow-up. So on August 18th, which is actually one of the best days of the year because that's my birthday. Yes. On August 18th. We uh, did it for you, Sokovi. <laughs> we, we also, that day, we also, uh, there's a coalition of community leaders, uh, you right. know, folks like Maria Payne, who's on right now, uh, Monica Brooks, uh, folks from the Salisbury um, NLTP, right. uh, Food and Water Watch, uh, Environmental Integrity Project. Uh, we sent a letter to the governor you know, highlighting the uprise against racism in this country right. and asking the governor, you know, what are you doing to address systemic racism, you know, environmental racism, environmental justice in state. In that letter, we talked about the commission. We talked about, you know, the need for more bills to be passed to look at cumulative impacts. We talked about things around zoning. 
So I want you to kind of dig more into because there's a there's a there's a strong critique of the commission, and I'm been one of the leading people since I've yeah. been here in 2011. I think the commission hasn't done enough. The reason why I say that is I'm also on the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Right. So to me, even in NEJAC, in many ways, you've heard me say to you this before, I say it's a gold standard commission, but we have limited power too within the EPA. So folks want to see the commission do more. Folks want to see the commission be more representative. Uh, and and just, just for all the agencies, and this includes at the county level, and this is for the delegates too, um, every county agency, in my opinion, every state agency, how are you going to address environmental injustice? Also, for you, Kelly, if you don't have a plan, as Kelly said, what's your plan? Where's the plan? You know, and so I just want you to speak more to that MBE's plan, also the plan for the commission moving forward as relates to uh, the, because, because uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but Kelly just talked about the culture too. And I forgot to say that there was a recent study that came out uh, about in the EPA, there was a book that was written about working inside government agencies. How do you advance environmental justice when folks inside the agency don't believe it, right? So cultural change within your agencies and then also having a plan to address advanced environmental justice and how commissions play a role in that. So I just want to put it back to you, um, Commission, I mean, Secretary Grumble, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So the very first step is making sure that uh, <clears throat> there's a restoration and environmental justice from the inside out. And so uh, our uh, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Elaine McNeil, is forming a, a, an employee-led advisory group to help us uh, continue to make progress on diversity uh, within our own department. Uh, we have a fairly diverse and talented workforce, but we can do more uh, in terms of uh, senior level decision makers and retention and recruiting. Uh, but uh, she's working on that and I'm going to be very involved in that. And it's all, of, it's embracing that restoration from the inside out. For purposes of the environmental justice plan, there are gonna be many players in shaping a plan. Um, but one thing for, for us at MDE is we do recognize, um, and, and this came out in, in large part from the uh, Brandywine settlement, but also from our own initiatives prior to Brandywine to coordinate our air, water, waste departments to develop an environmental justice policy on siting uh, and permitting to deal with that very real issue of cumulative impacts. So the Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities is going to be discussing, I believe at its next meeting, how to uh, uh, shape some recommendations on a uh, environmental justice plan beyond just MDE. Uh, we're also having a, a round table with the county. There, there, are several, there are several chief equity officers in counties in, in Maryland, and they're going to be uh, meeting with members of the Climate Change Commission and the Environmental Justice Commission to give insights on that front. But, but it, you're right, there, there needs to be specific milestones and plans, and we are developing those, and we are also making decisions in the meantime that help to benefit um, and protect overburdened and underserved communities. That's why I'm so, uh, I'm so enthused about the future because we are all embracing zero emission vehicles. The question is how soon and how, you know, how do we specifically do that? And not just vehicles, but those um, trucks and buses. That's something Maryland and the other states that have signed the national MOU on are all committed to. It's, it's another example of how you advance environmental justice by embracing zero emission. Well, thank you for that. I think, I mean, I think, this, of course, we're going to have some additional follow-up with you, the Secretary, as well as that coalition on, on the next steps. Yeah. I appreciate your last point about electric vehicles. So electrification could be seen as a health intervention. Electrification can also be seen as a economic, creating new economic opportunity structures, particularly for right. those with burden. I think it's important. I think Delegate Chark is talking about that. So if you can lead with yeah. that kind of work and do that, that's going to be the impact I think that many communities we're talking about frontline fiscal communities need. Uh, so thank you for that. And yeah. uh, I, I want to I want to pass the mic now to uh, Director Gill. Can you talk more about what you see for the future of you know the Prince's County EJ Commission and this work and working with the delegates 
and also working with county council on, on some of these efforts? Uh, sure. Um, let me say this. I think the, the, the Prince George's County Commission, I think it's set to uh, expire at the end of this year. Uh, but I have a few additional thoughts that I want to present to, to everyone here to talk about the fact that the impacts here are local. I used to serve on the state level, but all these impacts are local impacts. So, and, and some of the solutions are actually fairly easy. If you're worried about air quality within the beltway, then require as a condition of a permit or any permit that may impact air quality, one year of baseline monitoring or more. Just make them put it in and do it. Don't call it cumulative impacts. Call it environmental injustice impact statement. Environmental injustice impact statement. Have it be broader than cumulative impacts. Third, understand, again, the impact here is at the local level. So what's important is that the, the, the General Assembly be able to enact legislation that can work on the Eastern Shore, Western Maryland, all throughout the state. That's why I began by talking about local land use. Odd, odd place to go, the land, the land use article, the comprehensive planning article. If every local jurisdiction, I can't mandate this right, through the county council, but if every local jurisdiction in Maryland were required to adopt a comprehensive plan and as a planning element, incorporate equity and environmental injustice, addressing those issues, that would be a start for a statewide conversation. Thank you, thank you for that. Do, do any other uh, uh, panelists, delegates, y'all wanna chime in quickly on this discussion or, or Kelly as well, of the role of commissions and what you would like to see? I, I know maybe Delegate Lerman, you may have some comments you wanna sure, add? I just, nobody's mentioned plastic yet. So I feel compelled go to ahead, talk about ahead. the life cycle of plastics. And, you know, I think it's really, I'm glad we're talking about electrification, which is, you know, vital um, in terms of reducing the climate, um, uh, in terms of climate change, because of course the transportation sector is the number one cause of emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland. Um, but. I think we also have to be talking about plastics um, because the plastic life cycle doesn't just start when it's already a plastic bottle or a plastic bags, right? These are, um, plastic is made in plants, you know, power plants, um, not, not power plants, but in plants that are emitting horrible, um, uh, horrible emissions. And in 2019, um, just last year, the production and incineration of plastic produced um, 850 million metric tons of greenhouse gases, which is about 189, 500 megawatt coal power plants. So the plastic life cycle um, is huge. And as, you know, as Delegate Charcuti had noted, you know, natural gas has become so cheap. <laughs> and that leads to, in plastic, what that means is that there is, rather than demand for plastic, you know, nobody said, oh, I really want my, uh, my lettuce to come in a hard plastic clamshell now. But producers um, are pushing it. So it's a supply driven um, economy at this point for plastics and they face no, I mean, there's huge externality issues with plastics and the producers face none of those costs right now. Um, but in, on the majority of other countries um, in the Western hemisphere, we, they have uh, EPR, um, extended producer responsibility, where producers are facing some of the costs and are bearing some of the costs for what they are making. Um, and we, that is no, those are not policies that have been widely adopted yet in this country, but it's something that we have to look at because we have to make sure that the producers of the plastics that are causing all these problems much farther downstream in our communities, in our, you know, I think county level officials will talk about how expensive it is to deal with all of the single use plastics that are accumulating. Um, we're, ordinary citizens are putting the bill for that in terms of their health care, in terms of uh, dirtier communities, um, plastic strewn neighborhoods and in our waterways. Um, and are, we're having to pay for the cleanups of that and the producers are not paying any of the costs. And so I just think it's important that we also include plastics and plastic production when we're talking about clean air and the lack of accountability uh, for our producers. Because right now, 
they're getting off scot-free. <laughs> and we're the ones who are footing the bill um, and paying for it in terms of our health and our neighborhoods uh, and quality of life. So I just wanted to throw out, throw that out as well and associate myself with all of the comments that have been made so far on the panel. This is excellent. No, no thank you for that. And just to kind of summarize that, that point that the delegate Lerman is making, how can we as you know, citizens, as residents, how can you as leaders and agencies and delegates get the producers to internalize the cost, right, Delegate Charcoalian? So we're talking about the social costs, the economic costs, the health costs, and the environmental costs. And on the other hand, how can we make sure communities that are overburdened get more of the benefits, the social benefits, the economic benefits, the environmental benefits, and the health benefits? That, that's, I think that's part of what we're talking about in environmental justice. Different burdens and different benefits. So how can we stop these externalities and shift the costs back to producers? How can we invest, as, as Kelly says, some equity and bring in more investments into communities, right? As, as uh, Director Gill mentioned with the environmental benefits districts. That to me, uh, this is again, uh, just a shout out to that and call out for the delegates. Please push those types of initiatives where it's about community building. EBDs are about jobs. Environmental justice movement has never been anti-jobs. It's been pro-community, pro-economic justice, pro-environmental justice, pro-social justice, pro-health justice. So in your bills, they just don't have to be stopping bills. They can be building, growing, hope, hopeful bills. Okay, so I just want to say that because I'm going to close this out. I'm going to give y'all uh, a lightning kind of summary. Then I want to give time for the audience to, 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 to give us questions before we get to our lunch break. So can each of you, and I'm going to start with um, Kelly, can each of you kind of do a one minute summary about your thoughts about how we can move forward uh, when it comes to regulations, when it comes to legislation, when it comes to actions from agencies to advance environmental justice? Go ahead, Kelly. Um, well, I think one of the things that, you know, we've been doing is that, you know, we, we believe that all programs can increase our understanding of historic racism and environmental justice and how EJ might be advanced through their work. Um, but some of the things that we've been doing is advancing EJ through policy and enforcement. So, for example, um, the district got a large settlement from the Volkswagen beneficiary um, plan, and we added additional money to that so that if the projects that were applying for the funding were going to um, cite the vehicles that are going to be replaced um, exclusively in environmental justice communities, they would receive more funding. This was our way of helping to ensure that some of those resources were directly um, invested in the communities that needed them the most. Um, as part of the MOU um, that, um, that DC um, was party to, as well as Maryland on medium duty, heavy duty vehicles, um, one of the things that the district pledged to do was to ensure that that technology was deployed first in the communities that are disproportionately um, burdened by air pollution. So using our in, um, enforcement um, dollars, you know, the, 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 the violations that we do recapture from, um, from, from polluters, um, to make sure that that money gets invested through supplemental environmental programs back into the communities that receive the harms. Um, that's one of the things that we can do that we can do now at, while we wait for the legislation to cap, catch up, while we um, work through the challenges that exist in implementing environmental justice throughout government um, so that we can um, that we can start realizing so that the communities that need the most can start realizing the benefits while the legislation while the policy catches up. Thank you. And uh, Delegate Avi. But uh, what, what can we, what, what's next? What should Absolutely. We um, so in the upcoming General Assembly session, you know, there are so many different issues that we're going to have to tackle. Um, and I think all of them are, are super important. Um, and so it's going to be really important that we prioritize environmental justice as well. Um, and so we're going to need you um, to, to raise your voices and, and to really show up in Annapolis uh, to remind everyone that, yes, we're, there are so many things going on right now um, that we need to handle. We also need to focus on this super significant issue. Um, also being mindful that it's not only going to take place at the, the state level. Uh, we have to advocate our county uh, representatives uh, and also our federal representatives so that they know that this issue requires the urgency um, that it does. And so I think that's really what we're going to have to do. Um, we're going to have to make sure that this is a priority uh, as we move forward. 
and that's not a that's not an easy lift because there's so many things that are on the table already, um, and, and we could talk about some of those issues for hours and hours. Um, and so I would just say that we all need to make sure that we lift our voices up and that we remind our elected officials that this is something that we have to address now, not 10 years from now, uh, not even two years from now, uh, but in this upcoming legislative session. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Lerman, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm mute. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd echo that. I think, you know, it's just important to keep speaking up and keep organizing. I, I mean, there's nothing, you just have to persist, right? And, and I think it's important to, one of the ways, you know, I'm excited that on October 1st, Maryland will be the first state in the country to implement a foam ban on foam uh, packaging and beverages. And, um, you know, although it's become a little silly, I think that it's important, right? Because we have to make, even if it's gradual changes to wean ourselves off of these products and wean ourselves off of um, these, uh, some of the most dangerous things, we can also speak loudly as consumers. Um, and I think even if it means starting at a county level, um, that you should do it or municipal level, right? If, if we can't pass something at the state level right away, let's go pass it at the county level and let's get multiple counties to pass it and then take it back to the state and say, look, see, it's fine. We're all living fine just without these products. So let's pass it at a state level, right? I mean, I think you've just got to keep moving forward and we all have to keep moving forward. And, you know, it's been great to see, I think, more and more people really understanding the importance of these issues in the state legislature. Um, and I will say, I really think there's been been um, an awakening in the past couple years in terms of a lot of these issues and it makes it easier for us to bring them um, to leadership and to make sure that other people that there's public pressure um, to pass some of these uh, some of these bills as well I mean when we did the styrofoam ban um, that year it had passed in several counties before we were able to pass it at the state level, but there was a poll out. We did not do the poll. I did not want a poll. I was worried, <laughs> but a poll went out, an independent poll went out during session on it, and almost two-thirds of Marylanders supported it. I, I mean, it was like, a no, and then it became almost a no-brainer. It was like, of course we're going to do this, you know, so, um, and at the end of the day, the only people who were truly against it were, right, the American Chemistry Council and DART, um, you know, so you have to just sort of keep pushing forward, I think, um, and persist. Thank you. Let's go to Director Gill. What are the next steps? So back in 2004, the Maryland Department of the Environment had an environmental benefits districts program, um, investing in different parts of the state, including uh, central Prince George's County, uh, which came up earlier. I mentioned the benefits districts for, for this reason. Environmental injustice is a legal issue and it's a policy issue, but at bottom, it's a moral issue. And there is one document that the Maryland General Assembly passes every year that is a moral document, and that's your budget. That's the budget. The budget reflects the people's priorities. The Maryland budget is $43.6 billion last time I looked. I think there are funding streams that can be dedicated to local jurisdictions who have communities impacted by environmental injustice to make a difference right now. Well, thank you for that really important point. I think just to highlight that again, in the environmental benefits district report that we wrote, we actually talk about some of those funding streams. So it's, it's like you said, Director Gill, delegates, um, some of these things don't have to be bills. Some just working with your agency partners and saying, hey, here are the funding streams. Use us, let's make sure we have the right tools to know where the money should be going. That's a quick plug for the EJ screen tool, which I haven't talked about at all, but we need to have a Maryland EJ screen tool. We have it, let's use it, okay? Okay, so thank you for that, Director Gill. Let's go next to uh, Secretary Grumbles. I know you're doing a lot of work. I know it's gonna be a lot more conversation, but, but what are the next steps? I mean, we're supposed to have a meeting next week. So what, what's happening in the next 30 days, the, the next three months for you when it comes to implementing the governor's, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Commission's DEIJ plan and your work with the commission and your work uh, with Tad and others and your, your staff when it comes to advancing environmental justice? 
So uh, what I wanted to say, since we haven't really talked about COVID-19, is that COVID-19 is a horrific mm -hmm. reminder that in a crisis, public health trumps everything else. And that to recover from that crisis, you need to make sure that public health and environmental protection and economic growth can go together hand in hand. And so for me, the key is to underscore that diversity and equity are the key to resilience and sustainability. And th that is such a fundamental message and that we have to do a lot more work on diversity and equity. And, and so specifically, uh, a focus is on ensuring the Environmental Justice Commission has a clear, clearer path and vision to pr providing recommendations and reports to underscore that connection between environmental justice and environmental and economic uh, progress. And, and we'll, I'll be committed to doing that and also making sure our Climate Change Commission uh, delivers its report on time and, and with an emphasis on climate justice. Thank you. And our team is happy to provide demos uh, of the tools that we've been working on, okay. including the EJ Screen tool to those commissions. And we're in the process of developing a climate equity and health tool just for all the delegates too, to know we're working on climate equity and health tool for the state of Maryland too. That could be useful. So last word, uh, leave the last word for uh, Delegate Charcutian. Uh oh, the pressure's on. Okay, so um, first I wanna thank you Secretary Grumbles for bringing up the issue of, of COVID-19. And so if, it, if we haven't said it enough today, uh, earlier, the deaths that are associated with COVID-19, the disparities in brown and black communities and low-income communities are directly tied to the communities that are uh, great, most significantly impacted by fossil fuel burning. Um, and so we cannot, as we're saying, how are we gonna respond to COVID-19? We've got to be saying, how are we gonna clean up the air that causes the underlying conditions that makes these communities have higher death rates um, than the more privileged communities. So that's a really important piece. So it's not where we can't just say we're gonna only respond to health because that's the crisis now. It's all interrelated. And the second piece, and I would sort of build on what Secretary Grumble says is, um, we need to make sure we don't respond in a way that contracts the economy. And of course, investing in, investing now, investing in a clean economy with a priority on environmental justice communities is the way to um, respond to the recession that has also disproportionately hurt the same communities that are disproportionately hurt by, uh, by the pollution and by, by the environmental injustice. Um, I think that as individual legislators, in every single bill that we write, we have an opportunity to look at it, even though we don't yet have a, a body um, within the legislative services that screens all of our bills, we can screen all of our bills. And you, as activists, can hold us accountable for screening all of our bills. So I'm writing a bill that's related to geothermal investment. And a piece of it is going to be making sure the incentive is higher if that investment is in low income communities. So one minor, very specific point, but every single bill that we write can have that as a piece of what it is we're doing to start to correct in large or small ways to start to correct the injustices that we've built over 500 years in this country. And so I would echo Delegate Ivy's comments. Um, please continue to hold us accountable, to continue to hold our colleagues accountable, hold the um, administration accountable and, and really stay involved. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to, to do this work and, and I look forward to working with a lot of the folks who are listening to this panel right now. Okay. Great. Thank you, uh, Delegate Charcoulian. Thank you, panel. Can't give the applause <laughs> like we can in person. We just want to applaud everyone on the panel. I know, you know, you're doing some tough work in really tough times. And I want to applaud all the great work you're doing and all the insight. And, and I think, you know, we can move forward together. As I think, as, as, as Delegate uh, Lerman said, on these issues. Uh, what I want to be able to do now, we're, we're transitioning to lunch break. Got a little bit of background noise, too. Uh, transition to lunch break. But I want to a quick question or two that we can take uh, for the before uh, we transition to this lunch break. No, wait. Any questions? Speaker view. No. Between your fingers. You're always on the screen. If you Several questions in the Q&A. Yeah, any questions in the Q&A, Yeah. Yes. So one that has been 
upvoted. There, there are two that have been upvoted by the by the audience members. Um, one, one reason from an anonymous attendee, I hear a lot of the panelists speaking on pollution and clean air energy in Maryland. I live on Route 5, where in three mile radius, there will be nice nine gas stations. How does this fit into the plan for clean air and energy in Maryland, especially in PG County? Maybe that's Delegate Ivy. Or, sure. uh, or it's absolutely field. something that we need to address. Um, you know, again, what we're prioritizing. Um, now, individuals will point to the fact that, you know, we haven't transitioned away from fossil fuels yet. Um, so we need these these ports and, and sources. Um, but we do need to prioritize moving towards renewable energy sources, uh, providing the incentives that would make it a reality for uh, for everyone in Prince George's and across the state of Maryland. Um, right now, you can get electric vehicles. Um, you can get um you know, zero emission um, transportation, but it, it's 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 very expensive, uh, and so we need it to be something that is um, accessible for Prince Georgians, um, so that we can make it a reality. Uh, but but first, we have to even prioritize environmental justice at all, and I think that's really the first step. Thank you for that. Uh, we will have a speaker, Shelley Francis from EV Nor, who talks about uh, electrification equity and bringing uh, uh, electric vehicles uh, and charging stations to communities of color later on, I think today. But that's a really important point to be to uplift. And that's gonna be an important resource for communities that are overburdened as you said, by fossil fuels, like the whole life cycle of fossil fuels. Uh, there's a next question, uh, question for Director Gill. How do you see environmental justice principles being applied to the process of developing Prince George's County's climate action plan? And how we can make sure impact the communities or voices are heard in this process. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, directly. So on the, on the state level, as Secretary Grumbles mentioned, uh, Maryland's really been a groundbreaking state in terms of developing climate action plans. On the state level, there is uh, uh, several different work groups, one on greenhouse gas uh, reductions and the second on adaptation and resilience. And as part of the adaptation and resiliency work group, the, uh, the concept of, of equity and environmental justice and considering the impacts of climate on, on vulnerable communities uh, is a central component of the work that that commission is doing. We expect to be doing the exact same thing. Uh, the issues involving uh, more frequent storm events uh, that are causing flooding like we've never seen before, the issues of higher temperatures, uh, in areas that are, that are, for which there are no trees, there's no uh, way to absorb the carbon. So those are very difficult for vulnerable populations. So, so environmental justice and equity will be very much a part of the work we're going to be doing on the Climate Action Commission. Thank you for that, Director Gill. So let's thank our panelists again in any ways that you can thank them on this virtual environment. I'm going to pass the mic over to Yan to give an update on what's next for us for the, for, for the, for the rest of the day. Go ahead, Yan. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, and thank you, panelists. Thanks, everybody. So thanks, moving everybody. forward through, oh, thanks, everyone. Moving forward through the rest of the day, we're going to take a 30-minute break now and come back at 1 o'clock. I've posted a link to the attendee packet, which is a folder that has the program for the day as well as the agenda and some graphics. It also has the same document that you would have gotten in your email with uh, links to the rest of the day's sessions. We have four sessions split across two blocks for the rest of the day. Um, so check out and see which ones you want to attend. As always, if you have any questions, you can send, uh, you can send them to Siege Lab, C-E-E-J-H-L-A-B uh, at gmail.com and we'll address those uh, all day long. Okay, thanks. See y'all back at one o'clock. Yep, and this room will remain open for uh, any kind of technical assistance. This is the help desk room for the rest of the day, and you'll also be joining back in this room for the closing remarks. Oh, thanks. Presentation, uh, you know, use of, you know, talking about, you know, music and protest. Uh, with Bob Marley, and you talk about the Babylon. Uh, I mean, the, the state report back panel, the state and county report back panel, appreciate all the speakers, all the delegates, the agency folks who really talk about the work they're doing and the challenges they have to step up in, in the time. They need to, need to step up and, and the solutions. 
and the, and the hard work that needs to be done. Uh, also, thank you know folks who I heard uh, briefly that the legislative session went really really well. The, the federal legislation session, uh, the EPHC session went well. With the discussion with Cliff Mitchell about how can we improve that that data. Uh, we had a, a pro bono legal session. Hopefully, folks were able to you know hear about how working with lawyers is important. One of my community mentors, would make, Wilson, would say, you know, he would go into community meetings, uh, town council meetings, he wouldn't have a lawyer. He felt naked. You got to have a good lawyer. You, community folks, you need a good scientist and you need a good lawyer, right? That's part of your team. Uh, I helped to moderate the climate change uh, session, Beyond Resilience. That was a very powerful session. And what came out of that session is, we, and this is the thing about environmental justice, we have that community-driven solutions, community-owned and managed. For us to move forward with climate justice and environmental justice, we have to start with community and we have to end with community. And we have to really focus on, on those communities who are frontline and fence line. We have to value the cultural community knowledge systems. As was said in our session, when it, as it relates to environmental justice, climate justice, or any type of disaster, it's the same folks hit first, hit worse, and hit the most. Whether it be COVID-19, whether it be Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Sally, you got tropical storm beta, whether it be the forest fires in California, whether it be sunny day flooding, whether it be due to sea level rise, whether it be heat waves that hell for the poor and the elderly. It's the same populations who are hit back to the most, first, worst, and the most. So they need to be at the table driving these discussions. They need to be at the table talking about the solutions. They need to be at the table where resources are being divvied up so they can get the monies to invest in their communities. Just transition, just sustainability, just housing, just food, you know, human rights to uh, air and water. As Jackie said before, people have a human right to energy. People have a human right to water. Shouldn't have to choose those things. So in this discussion today, we're talking about giving people sovereignty so they can get their inalienable rights to clean air, clean water, safe food, safe housing. So what I want to leave y'all with today, community-driven solutions are, are the way forward. The action is the way forward. Building trust, delegates stepping up, agencies stepping up, beyond regulation. Regulations are not enough. Monitoring is not enough. That's what we heard today. Okay, and so I want to thank our sponsors. There are many, Sierra Club, Union Concerned Scientists, Earth Justice. Uh, we have Namati, uh, Chesapeake Bay Trust, School of Public Health. Thank you for your funding. Thank you for support, you know, this year and previous years. Again, thank our keynote speaker, our ninth annual siege keynote speaker, uh, Jackie Patterson. I want to thank our student team, uh, Yan Michael Archer. Great job, again, with Symposium, Secure Carter, uh, Ngozi, who's, who, you know, one of our high school students, actually, who's been working, helping us out, holding down the fort, doing great EJ work. Thank you. Salim, uh, 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 Rami, some of our other students, also staff, uh, Joe, who's been putting, that, putting the work for the symposium. I uh, thank all the folks who attended the session. And, and just for next week, remember, we have two more days of the symposium. So we have, uh, COVID-19 has made it difficult for us to come together, and it's not safe for us to meet in person. So we, we spread the symposium out across four days. Next week, uh, we, we're gonna have day three of the symposium. And day three of the symposium, we're gonna have, a, again, a, a round of great sessions. Uh, we're gonna have a panel uh, about foundation funding. We're gonna have additional se sessions on energy justice. Uh, we're gonna have sessions a, a, about environmental rules and regulations like NEPA uh, and, and Trump rollbacks. Uh, and, and then we're gonna, we're gonna have, we're gonna close the day out with a really powerful session on climate justice organized by the NWCP. We're gonna have, we're gonna have folks and climate justice coordinators for NWCP from Alaska, from Hawaii, from Maryland, from Michigan, and from California. And so please come back, join us next week. Thank you again for you know, being part of a powerful conversation. And thank you for the promise of being part of powerful uh, solutions and being part uh, being part of a movement uh, moving forward. So uh, thank you again. I appreciate everyone and enjoy uh, the rest of your day. Um, and so forward together. That's right, Belinda. Let's do it. Okay, family. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you same uh, bat time, same bat channel.
uh, next Saturday at 10 a.m. Y'all take care. Before, before everyone rolls out, thank you, Dr. Wilson. I just want to drop one last time the attendee packet link. We are going to be, we update this uh, each week with the relevant documents for the upcoming sessions. So this link is now in the chat. Please save it, bookmark it. That is your one-stop shop for all things 2020 EJ Symposium. And keep an eye on our website for the postings of the recorded sessions. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.